before we say a lot about number three, I want you to, uh, I want to share what's on the board here. We went through this. That you, now these numbers only work in the Bible. They're not to be used outside the Bible. Now a lot of Christians try to do that. They try to make things say things that really aren't there. I told you about this one lady that told me she was in room 361 and 3 was the number of resurrection and 6 was the number of man and 1 was the number of unity. So she was trying to get a spiritual message out of that. The numbers are biblical. These are biblical numbers. Now numbers have significance of course, uh, but uh, this is not what we're teaching. We're not te teaching sensationalism. We're teaching numbers from the perspective of God's Word. Number one is the number of unity, and number two is the number of division, uh, or witnessing, or union. We, we went over that. Number three today is the number of, of divine completeness, perfection, or resurrection. Uh, it's, it's one of the most important numbers of all the numbers, and we'll be giving you scriptures as we move along. Thank but you, Mary. Yes. Could you explain your five plus five the way you did last week so the people that weren't here will sure. understand it? Yeah, definitely. We'll put it on the board. It's on there. Oh, it's on there now? Where? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was talking to, listen, numbers of the Bible work in, in more than one way. Uh, they can have... If the number is doubled, that intensifies the meaning of the number. Uh, you can take these biblical numbers and add them together. Okay, just like for instance. Now the number five, if you look on your, your paper there, is the number of what? It's the number of grace. Five's the number of grace. The fifth time that Noah's name is found in the book of Genesis, it says, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We just studied the book of Ruth. The fifth time her name is found, the Bible said she found favor in the eyes of Boaz. The same word, favor and grace, is the same word. All right, so five is the number of grace. So you take five, the number of grace, and then let's add the number of grace. We doubled it. It comes up to ten. Ten in your numbers is the number of testimony. So uh, I told you, the way I showed you was by our hands, People started counting with their fingers, their toes, uh, rocks, stones, sticks, whatever they had available. Uh, as, as you know, and I, I did a thorough study of numbers before I was teaching this. I've been teaching numbers for over 30 years to classes. But then I went back and studied numbers from the standpoint of the Babylonians and the Phoenicians, the Sumerians, and the older Egyptians, the civilizations, and they have found through the cuneiform writing on cave walls and in tombs in Egypt, uh, the numbers and how they, they had a decimal system like we do today, the number 10, the decimal system. And probably that came from the fact that we have 10 fingers and 10 toes in our body, and 10 is a number of testimony. So listen, 10 is a number of the testimony of the grace of God. Uh, and that's just how God has worked it out. These numbers are so important. And we'll, we'll bring up more things like that. Grace is, is, is one of the most important ones, I think, and, and so on. But now listen, uh, the, the numbers of the Bible all have significance. They're very important. Now, I also mentioned last week, and I want to mention again, the law of first mention. Now, there, there, uh, if you ever study hermeneutics, which is the, the science of bi the biblical interpretation, they will teach you about the laws, the three laws of mention. There's the law of first mention. There's the law of, <clears throat> excuse me, there's the law of further mention, and then there's the law of full mention. Uh, let me, do you want me to write that down for you? Uh, I've got it right here, the law of first mention. The first, actually, this is the first time in your Bible that any truth, any segment of truth, any number, any phrase, any word is seen. That will be the meaning of that word throughout the remainder of the scriptures. Now, the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. That's what the word means. The begin and anything that begins in Genesis will end in the book of Revelation because that's the complete and final authority and revelation of God. We have a Bible that God has given us. This is not everything that happened during this time frame. Uh, it's not everything that God knows. Now, keep that in mind. It's what God has given us that we can study and learn from. 
that God's knowledge is so vast and so great. He is almighty. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. Uh, there is no way. The Bible said that what Jesus did in the 33 and a half years that he was here, the writer of John says, if you want to look it up in the last chapter of the book of John, which I'll do and read it to you, that way you don't have to spend time turning. But the, here's what he said in verse 31 of chapter 20. He said, these are written, that means the things in the book of John, are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Now then when you go over here to the very last chapter and the last verse, verse 25 of the next chapter, he said, there's also many other things which Jesus did. So this is not everything that Jesus did while he was here on this earth. And the Bible is not everything that happened during this segment of time at all. He said, there's many other things Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So we, d we just have a small bird's eye view of what went on in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ through the four Gospels and then the book of Acts following it with the apostles. So if we could comprehend every aspect of the Word of God, the plan of God, the redemption process of God in redeeming us, Listen, it would be phenomenal. We couldn't contain it. We cannot contain it all. And you take theologians that have devoted their life for a lifetime to the Scriptures. Uh, they don't even scratch the surface. The one thing about the Bible, you can study it today and look at the same portion of Scripture tomorrow or next week and you'll see something different popping out of it to you. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible said when He has come, He will reveal truth unto you. He's the Spirit of truth. And listen, just because you haven't heard somebody teach something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Because God may give me something that He doesn't give your pastor. He may give your pastor something He doesn't show me. That's why we all need each other and we compare what God has spoken through His Word. This morning I had a discourse with a preacher at, uh, at the gym. We, we stood there and talked and we, we talked about Matthew chapter 17 when Jesus went up into the mountain with Peter, James, and John and the Bible said He was transfigured before them. And even his raiment became glorified to the point where he outshone the sun, the Bible said. Yeah. What, what do you think is going to happen to you when you see Jesus in his full glory one day? I mean, if his raiment on the Mount of Transfiguration outshone the, the noonday sun in its brightness, you've never seen the sun because you can't see it because of its own brightness. Nobody can view the sun. We've never viewed the sun. We only see the sunlight. And one day that's all going to be cut off according to the book of Revelation. Are you with me? And the Bible says when we get in that city, the New Jerusalem, that we won't need the sun, we won't need the moon, we won't need the planetary heavens to light up anything for us because the Lamb is the light thereof. The Lamb is going to light the entire universe. Jesus is going to light the entire universe one day. How great is that? How awesome is that? I mean, that is so fantastic. I can't imagine what it's going to be like. And people say to me, well, you know, I don't want to be saved because I'd have to give up so much stuff out here in the world. Well, what has the world got compared to what Jesus is? Tell me what they have. They don't have anything compared to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, so... The Bible is not all that God knows. It's all that we could even comprehend a small, minute fragment of it in a lifetime. But let's get back to number three because I've got to move on. We just got 20 more minutes left to our time. And then uh, the law first mentioned means the first time that any subject, any number, any phrase, any object, any, any thought is expressed or mentioned in the Bible is going to be the special significance of it as it runs throughout the whole Bible. Uh, Genesis is, is good for that. And Well, okay, I didn't mean to say this, but it's coming to my mind right now. So let's go to Genesis 1. And, uh, and many people think and many people believe and preachers preach that the Holy Spirit was not active and wasn't at work until Pentecost. That is not true. 
The Holy Spirit has always been active. He's God incarnate. Listen, He's God the Holy Ghost, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. In Genesis chapter 1, the original creation of the earth is seen here. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, in the beginning, when God created the heaven and the earth, uh, it wasn't like that, but there was something happened. Now, I personally believe this was where the fall of Saint Lucifer occurred between verses 1 and 2, and that's why the earth became void and dark and, and darkness, and many theologians teach that and believe that, of course. But then the Bible says, here, here you see the Spirit of God mentioned, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about the law first mentioned right here. This is the first time in your Bible that the Holy Spirit is mentioned, and what is the Holy Spirit doing? What's the, what's the verb there in that phrase? He is what? He's moving. Okay, that is going to show you, according to the law first mentioned, every time thereafter that you see references in the Bible to the Holy Spirit, what's He going to be doing? He's going to be moving. He's going to be moving. He's going to be moving. Listen, do you know why you can have a service and the Spirit of God be manifested? He is moving among His people. He lives in our hearts. Listen, but there's a manifested presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is all over the universe because He is God the Holy Spirit. But listen, I wish I could feel His presence every minute of every day, but I'll be the first to tell you I don't, and neither do you. Uh, you don't feel His presence. We don't walk by feelings. We don't live by feelings. We live by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 2 and 20 said, The life that I now live in the, the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Even when I don't feel Him, I know according to His Word, He is there. He is with me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. He will go with me all the way. The law of first mission tells me, though, that the Holy Spirit is in the, the uh, work of moving upon the face of the waters. Now, let me show you what that means in, in the ancient Hebrew writing here, the Spirit of God moving. Um, how many knows about little baby chicks and the old hen, the mother chick. You know what I'm talking about? Now, how, uh, well, let's look at it from the standpoint, the Hebrew standpoint is a dove. So here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something for you. Uh, I'm going to show you how great an artist I am. You're going to be amazed at how I can't do it. Okay. <laughs> When I was a boy, I had, I had laying hens. I had five laying hens. I was a real businessman. I went, I've always had farming in my, my spirit, my mind. And I lived with my grandparents way down in Hawkins County most of my time I got in high school. Every summer I stayed with them and then on holidays and whatever. And they were farmers. And so, uh, you know what I'd see? I'd see this, uh, oh boy, I, you like that? How many of you know what I'm trying to make here? This is going to be a nest. And on this nest here, there's going to be a little, what, what are we going to have here? We're going to have a little. Now, what's that sitting on the nest? That's a, that's a hen. Well, let's call it a, huh? <laughs> you all are so funny. I, I love you all. I do. I'm going to call it a dove. I thought I was drawing a dove. It's more like a chicken, isn't it? Okay, it, this brings numbers in. Everything of nature comes in sevens. You think God's not got this all planned out? Do you know how many days it takes for a chicken to hatch babies? Anybody know? No? 21 days. Okay, look. 21, how do you get 21? Seven, let's take seven. Times what? Three. Okay, seven is a number of completeness. It's the perfect number. It's God's number. Everything that God created is re recreated again through the process of reproduction in sevens. A hen sits on the nest 21 days. A duck sits on the nest 28 days. How long does it take to make a baby? It's divisible by seven. Seven in everything of reproduction in nature. That's God, folks. That didn't just happen. 
That, it, that's, that's the amazing part about God's numbers. They are. Now, three is the number of resurrection. Life. That, that bird, that dove, sits on the nest for 21 days and from, from that incubation comes forth little birds, little doves, little chickens. It's seven times three or 21 days. But what happens here, she is, they, this is what is known as brooding. She's brooding. What is she doing to those eggs? She's keeping those eggs warm till inside that egg forms that little chick, okay? This is what the word moving in the Hebrew means. It means brooding or sitting on the nest, incubating eggs. The Holy Spirit is referred to in the Bible in, with many symbolic things, but one of the things he's referred to is fire or warmth. I didn't know I was going to teach this today. <laughs> But look, we're learning something, aren't we? Are we learning? Huh? Well, I want them to see what we're trying to do. Okay, thank you. Okay, now I lost my train of thought. Brooding, moving. Okay. It means, the word moving in the Hebrew means to flutter over the nest. Brood over the nest. Flutter over the nest. The Holy Spirit is likened, one of, one of the symbolic words is fire or warmth. Now listen, I want to ask you a question. When you feel the Holy Spirit, when He manifests His presence to you, uh, how do you feel in your body? How do you feel? Do you, do you, feel, a, do you feel a change in your, in your inner being inside of you? I mean, are you just like you're walking down the street normally or... Uh, you're doing your housework or you're mowing your yard. No, what? There's, there's a sensation that comes into your being like what? Warmth, a feeling of, and, and listen, I mean, just like right now when I said that, look at the hair on my arm, it just stood up. Listen, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit's moving upon us. He moves upon us. He, and you know what he's doing? He's giving us life. He's producing life. He that hath the Son of God, the Bible says, has life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. So this is, this is what happens, and that's why those eggs incubate is because the warmth that comes from the mother bird or the hen. So he's likened to fire. Uh, Elijah in the Old Test Testament was the prophet of what? Fire. And he prayed and the fire fell from heaven. Uh, you see all through the, well, on the day of Pentecost, uh, and by the way, numbers here in Pentecost. Here, this is, this is the Greek, penta. What does that mean? Five. So, uh, Jesus Christ said he, he, he came, he died on the cross, and between Passover and Pentecost was how many days? Forty days. Okay, forty. Do you know what the number forty means in biblical numbers? It means trials, testings, and probation. So between Passover and Pentecost was 40 days, and he said, continue to tarry in Jerusalem. They were in the upper room where the, he had had his last supper with his disciples. That was at the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. If you'll turn to Acts chapter 12, you will find an incident in the early church history where that Peter was put in prison because he was preaching in the name of Jesus. By the way, if we don't preach in the name of Jesus, we have no power. We have no authority. My words don't mean one thing unless they're empowered with the Holy Spirit of God. And that's why a preacher has to be anointed. That's why you've got to have anointed preaching. You've got to have anointed singing. You've got to have anointed worship. You've got to have everything under the influence and power of the Holy Spirit because otherwise it's what the flesh can produce. I hear so low a sing from right here, from here out. And you know what's wrong with their eyes? They're dead. There's no life. But when you see somebody get up and the anointing is upon that person, you'll see their eyes lighten up. You'll see a difference in their composure. You'll see a difference in their output. 
and the words have power and when they sing those words, they touch your heart and you feel and sense the Holy Spirit in you connecting to what's going on there on that stage. That's the anointing work of the Holy Spirit. That's the moving work of the Holy Spirit. Folks, we have to have that. So how do you know we have to have it? Jesus told his disciples, he said, don't you start any Sunday school work. Don't you do any evangelism until you wait for the promise of the Father. And on the day, and they went into that upper room as individual disciples, 120 of them, witnesses of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, waiting for the promise of the Father. And the next feast day was Pentecost, which was 50 days after Passover. And there they are sitting, and about 9 o'clock that morning, it was on a Sunday morning, the morrow after the Sabbath, and there they sat there waiting for the promise. And you know what happened? You read Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit in His fullness came. He had been working all through Old Testament days in a different way. He came and went on people. He did not abide with them forever as He does with us. He came and went. He would anoint a king. Then when that king's ministry was done, he would leave off that king and go to the next one. As they anointed with oil, he would enter upon them and sometimes in them. David had three anointings before he ever took the throne. Solomon was anointed. Prophets were anointed. Priests were anointed. I told somebody the other day, they even anointed the pots and the pans and the dippers and the spoons and in the tabernacle. They anointed everything with two anointings. They anointed with oil and they anointed with blood. There's got to be, listen, in your life as a believer, you've got to have the blood of Jesus and you've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now you say, well, Larry, you, you're talking like you're some kind of a Pentecostal. No, I'm a Bible believer. And I, I was raised up under old-fashioned Holy Ghost preachers that were anointed to preach the Word. I've seen them, listen, I've been in services when there was such an anointing they couldn't even enter the pulpit. I had a revival one time with a preacher called Bud Culberson. They call him the walking Bible. He memorized the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. He never had to open a Bible when he preached. He had it memorized. That's why they called him the walking Bible. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? But anyway, uh, one night we were in revival and he was, he was scheduled to preach and there was such a power and uh, an anointing on that service that he tried to go to the pulpit and he couldn't. He couldn't get into the pulpit. He said, was that biblical? I read when they dedicated the temple in the Old Testament, the Bible said Solomon finished praying and the Bible said the glory was so great that the priest couldn't enter into minister. That's what the Bible said. Boy, that'd tear up a lot of Baptist uh, bulletins, wouldn't it? Oh, I'm sure. Back years ago when I was here, we had a phenomenal moving of God. I mean, I, and I'm hoping and praying that we'll see a great outpouring in these last days, not just here, but all over the place. Listen, we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The world is in such bad shape. If my father could come back here today after preaching prophecy for, 20, for 60 years, and he's been gone 22, he, it would scare him. He knew prophetic uh, things from the Word of God, but he didn't know what's happening. With AI going on and all this artificial intelligence and all this stuff that's happening, listen, he didn't see all of that. He didn't know all that. That's not in the Bible as such, but it's there. We just It's not called that. But I'm telling you, we as believers are going to have to be spirit-filled. We're going to have to live at the foot of the cross. We're going to have to pray and touch the throne of grace with our prayers. If we don't, there will be people that will just, they'll just fall by the wayside because of the great pressure that the enemy is going to put upon them. The moving of the Holy Spirit is seen there in Genesis chapter 1, and that's what you're going to see in the, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, by the way, there was, a, there was an Old Testament Pentecost at Mount Sinai. That's the first Pentecost they observed. When they came out of Egypt, at the Passover, that was on April the 14th or the 15th is when they came out. The 14th of April is the, the day of Pentecost. And then when they, 50 days later, where are they in the wilderness? They're at Mount Sinai. And there at that Pentecost and the observance of Pentecost, 3,000 people were killed because while Moses was up in the mountain with God, the Bible said they committed adultery and fornication, had a golden calf worshiping it, and so on. And when Moses came down out of the mountain, he was so angered, he threw the stone tablets down, signifying that God's holy law could never be kept. It was a broken law. He had to have them rewritten again. God took his own finger and carved those in stone. If you'll read the Bible, you'll find that to be true. 
And so uh, uh, he had to get them a second time. But during that time of, of wickedness and ungodliness, they had forsaken the holiness of God and were committing all that sinful activity. Uh, 3,000 people died that day, according to the Word of God. You come to the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 are saved at the preaching of Peter. And so uh, you can see what the, the Holy Spirit does in moving. And we used to sing a little chorus around here that says, God is moving by His Spirit, moving in all the earth. Signs and wonders when God moveth, move, O oh Lord, in me. Now, I took you back 20 years, all right? But it's good. God, the Holy Spirit's work is moving. Well, that's the law first mentioned. Now, three is the number of resurrection. Of course, we can figure that one out, divine completeness and perfection. It carries the thought of divinity with it because God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Godhead. And then also three is uh, very important in the manifestation of life or resurrection life. Now, in the Old Testament, there is a record of three people being raised from the dead. Does anybody have any clue? Elisha, Elijah raised one from the dead. Then Elisha raised one from the dead. And then there's this awesome account of a, a caravan of Ishmaelites, and they had, had this guy who they'd killed, and, and, and so they're trying to find a burial place for this guy, and here comes along these people. They, want, they don't want them to know what's happening, so they just stuff his body down. What they didn't realize, it was the tomb of Elisha. It was a cave. It was a hole or an opening. And they put the dead man's body down in there, and Elisha was so spirit-filled that even after his death, his bones still had an anointing upon them. And when that man's body, that dead man's body, struck those dry bones of Elisha with that same anointing that he carried, he carried a double portion of the spirit of Elijah, the Bible said. Do you know that? And what happened? That dead man came back to life. That's called power. Amen. I'm telling you, that is supernatural power. So there were three people raised from the dead or recorded for us in the Old Testament. In the ministry of Jesus there, and in the New Testament, there were three people raised from the dead. Now, Jesus, if you, well, in the ministry of Jesus, because there was actually more than three people raised from the dead. The apostles raised some too as well. But let's talk about Jesus and his ministry, the number three. Three times that he raised somebody from the dead. Now, uh, he raised a little girl from the dead. She was probably around the age of 12. The Bible calls her a little damsel or a, a young girl. And her name was uh, Abitha, Tabitha. That was it. Uh, Tabitha raised her from the dead. The interesting thing about it, when he went to the home to raise her, when the servant said, my little daughter's dead, well, this was Jairus' daughter uh, that he also raised was it was Jairus the one that had the girl's name Tabitha? Was that her name or was Tabitha? Uh, Tabitha was another one. Maybe, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm confused. Boy, am I confused. You know, the, you know how you spell that? B-A-I-K. Boy, am I confused. Well, that's why I'm so confused. I say, think it starts with a K instead of a C. You'll catch that today sometime. <laughs> but then there was a young man that uh, they were on their way to bury him. And he left a widowed mother who was weeping and crying, and I'm sure. And Jesus comes in contact with this funeral possession. And what does Jesus do? Well, he just touches the young man and hands him over to his mama. <laughs> That's the Jesus we serve. Isn't that amazing? You say, Larry, I just don't, I wonder about stuff like that. I don't know if that really happened. Well, do you think he's going to get you up one day if you die? He is. He has power. He conquered death. And then at the tomb of Lazarus, his friend Lazarus, he'd been dead for four days and he was stinking. That's what they said. Amen. So Jesus goes to the grave and you know what he tells them? Take you away the stone. You know why we don't see the miracles that we need to see? We got too many stones in the way that we've not taken out of the way. A lot of the junk in our life are stones that the devil has put in our life and we need to get rid of those stones so there'd be a freeness 
that Jesus can work through us to touch other people's lives. As long as I'm carrying things in my heart and sin and jealousy and malice and hatred, the Bible said those sins quench the spirit. He says, quench not the spirit. And he says, let all wrath and anger and jealousy and malice and evil speaking put away from you because those are things. Listen, uh, when you look at me on the outside, you think, well, boy, you dress like a Christian. Well, I don't know how Christians are supposed to dress anyway. I mean, I don't know that you're supposed to dress any different than anybody else does. Uh, this shirt came from a factory somewhere that they made for all unsaved people to wear just like Christians. You drive on the same roads that liquor trucks drive on and stuff like that. There's a lot in the world that you can't do anything about, but you've got to live here and you've got to be a, a sanctified person. But it's not how much of the world is around you, it's how much of the world you've got inside of your, your spirit. There's where it's at, folks. It's internal, not external. See, I was brought up to believe everything was external, but it's not. I found out it's internal. And when the internal gets full of God, your external is going to take care of itself. You'll be wanting to glorify God externally in, in the way you live. But he, he raised Lazarus. He goes to the grave. I've been there. Did you get to go to the grave of Lazarus in Bethany? That, our group, our guide took us to Bethany there. That, that cave is about uh, way back under the earth. And there were about 70 steps that had to be come up to get out of that tomb. You say, how did Lazarus come out of there with the grave clothes wrapped around him like a mummy? The Spirit of God had to move him out of there. He couldn't walk. He was wrapped in, like a mummy. He had to float out by the Spirit of God. And when he got out, the Bible said Jesus turns to his family and says, loose him, get this garment off of him, unwind this death, this death shroud. And I've studied how they did the death shroud and so on upon dead people. They wrapped them up just like they did a little baby in swaddling clothes. And they plastered that with the spices and so on. They didn't do any internal bombing. But uh, Jesus said to them, said, loose him and let him go. When you get people saved right here in this congregation, it's your job as a congregation to loose them, set them free, teach them to lay aside weights and sins that thus so easily beset them and run the race with patience. That's why the Bible says for older women to teach the younger women and older men to teach the younger men. That's called discipleship. And I know some preachers say we don't need it. Yeah, we do need it because that's taught in the Word of God. You know what Matthew 28 and 18 said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then he said, teach them to observe whatsoever I have told you. Discipleship means that I take the knowledge that God has given me and I invest it in you and I teach you. Then you take what you've learned from me and you invest it in the next one and the next one. And it's a chain reaction. That's discipleship. And before you know it, you've got a church full of people that know what the pastor has taught them and others have taught them and Sunday school teachers have taught them and then they turn around and give that out. Listen, if, if what you're learning here in this class you're just keeping to yourself, you're going to be like a stagnated pond. You're not, you don't have an, you've got an inlet but you don't have an outlet. You've got to have an outlet to give that out to other people. You need to talk to people on the phone about it. You, when you meet them in the grocery store, hey, you know what I'm learning now? You know what I'm studying? Man, I go to this Bible study class. You know, we're studying numbers and you know what I found out? I found out number three this morning is the number of resurrection, resurrection life, divine completeness and fullness. And it's one of the most important numbers in the Hebrew alphabet. There's numbers to them that number one, number three, number seven, and number 10 were special numbers in, to the Hebrews. And this is a very important number. So it's a number of, uh, of resurrection. Now I mentioned this and I'm going to come to a close. Some of you, you feel your stomach growling. You know what I told a lady at the gym the other day? She said, my stomach growl. And she works there. And I said, I'd rather hear your stomach growl than your, your face growl. <laughs> anyway, that was bad. And I apologize. I apologize. It's no wonder she's not spoken to me since. <laughs> I apologize. But listen, on the Mount of Transfiguration, how many people did Jesus take up there on the Mount with him? There's Jesus and three. Why did he not take all those others? Peter, James, and John were going to be apostolic foundations for the New Testament church. If you'll study the book of Ephesians and the gifts of the Spirit, the Bible talks about how the apostles were foundations in the church. What does a foundation do? It starts the beginning of a building. It's the foundation point. And they were the foundation stones in the New Testament church. There was Peter. He preached at Pentecost. And here, let me point out about Peter. We've got so many people, you know, uh, I'm sorry to say that all of us in this room are sinners. Every one of us are sinners. 
If you think you're perfect, I'd like to meet somebody who lives with you and they'll tell me otherwise. <laughs> Nobody is perfect. The only perfect one is the one that lives and resides inside of you, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ in the person of the Holy Spirit. And listen, don't you need every... Listen, as often as we need to, we need to say, Lord, I, forgive me. I'm sorry, I don't mean to do this. Sins of omission, they're sins of commission. Now, the ones that we judge people for are sins of commission. And then we let our sins of omission go unjudged, you know. Well, I didn't read my Bible today, but, you know, I'll get more. I'll get to tomorrow. That's a sin. Oh, you all don't love me now, do you? Huh? Folks, it's true. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is what? Hey, you know that verse. Every day, you know what I have, there's, listen, there's a lot of stuff I have to do every day, but one, many times a day, I have to say, Father, I'm sorry. I said the wrong thing. Listen, I go through my life apologizing for my stupidity. I do. And you know who I apologize more to than anybody else is the Lord. Because I want to please my Heavenly Father. You know, my daddy was my hero, and I wanted to please him so much. I wanted, I wanted his approval. And I, I never did talk back to him. Now, I talked back to my mama. And boy, she blessed me too when I did. She was a blessing, but she was also a blisterer. She either blessed you or blistered you. And boy, she took care of what needed to be taken care of. Don't think she didn't. She would apply the Board of Education to the seat of knowledge. And it worked. It worked. And she didn't use a board, honey. She used a switch about that long. And you know how long it took her to give you a whip until that thing wore out? I'm telling you. But I, I want to tell you something. I bless her name today. She, she kept me out of a lot of sin, a lot of foolishness, a lot of ungodly stuff I'm sure that the devil would have had out there for me had I gone in that direction. But she kept tabs on us too. And when, when we'd go down there in that big field next to our house and smoke rabbit tobacco, we'd go eat an onion so she wouldn't smell it. We were just boys like everybody else. You know, they say the preacher's kids are the worst of all of them. And you know what I say? They have to play with the deacon's kids. Hey, Nancy, you tell your husband that. Hey, hey that's funny. I mean, I'm just kidding. But, but listen to me. Let's, let's look at this. I'm going to hush. Peter, James, and John, they were going to be foundational stones in the New Testament church. So if you look in the life of ministry, he took them everywhere. When he did a healing, when he raised that little girl from the dead, he put the crowd out of the house because they didn't believe on him anyway. They, they were doubters. And so he just said, you get out of here. And he took Peter and James and John with him. They were in his inner circle. And he was investing his life in them because he knew that upon his departure back to the Father that they were going to head up the New Testament ministry of the New Testament church. Now, while they were up on the mountain, what were the other disciples trying to do down in the valley? This dude had brought some, a uh, demon-possessed kid to, to him and said, you know, cast the demon out of him. He puts himself in the fire and he does this. He was probably uh, uh, epileptic or something. And they tried, but they couldn't do it. You want me to explain why? They did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at that time. Pentecost had not occurred. And when they were in the actual literal presence of Jesus Christ, they could perform miracles and do all kinds of stuff because he was there physically in body and he empowered them to do so. Now, they, he had already called them and given them that authority to go out and they had been doing that. But at that particular time, they had never dealt with anything of this magnitude. And because Jesus was over up there in the mountain and he wasn't there with them, they did not have that supernatural ability to do so because at that time they had to be in the presence of Jesus and commissioned by Jesus to do what they were doing. And until Pentecost, you don't see them acting with great power at all. Now, Peter, James, and John was in the presence with Jesus. That's why Peter said, Lord, it's good to be here. It was the Feast of Tabernacles. He said, let's just build three tabernacles up here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, they didn't feel like they were worthy to be a part of that, so they just going to stay on the outside of those little buildings, those tabernacles, and just be in the presence of these great men, Moses, Elijah, the two heroes, heroes of, of the Israel uh, history, Israeli history, and then Jesus, of course, the Son of God. And I'm not sure that until 
Matthew 17 that they really knew that he was the Son of God. I don't think they had complete knowledge of that until they saw him manifested in his divine glory. And that was a glorious experience to say the least. But that was resurrection power, resurrection life. I wish I could tell you the temptation in the wilderness that Jesus endured had three components. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And so will you as a believer have those three things to deal with the rest of your life. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And so it's important that we see the number three. Well, I'm going to have to close. We'll continue this next week. Uh, Jesus prayed three times in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Now the Jews looked at the number three as a very important number. Number one, number three, number five, number seven, number ten. And three times, here's what they would do. They would pray three times about something. And if there was no real answer or a no or whatever, they stopped praying about it. They didn't go on any further. Three was like a magical number in the, their mindset. So when Jesus, as a Jewish man, now he's praying in the garden, not as God, but he's praying as a man doing the will of his heavenly Father, and he comes under that burden, and the Bible said his sweat became as great drops of blood, and that happens to people. That's happened to sports people that will get so intense in what they're doing that they'll actually produce in their sweat a bloody substance. And there's a medical term for that, and I'm not... I don't remember it now without reading it, but uh, uh, he sweat the bloody sweat He's there in the garden. He said, let this cup pass from me. But when he gets to the third time of praying, what did he do? He changed his prayer to these words. He said, not my will, but thine be done. Paul, in the book of 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians rather, he tells us that there was given to him a thorn in the flesh that he would not be exalted above measure. And the Bible said that he went to the Lord how many times? One time? No. Two times? No. Three times. He prayed three times and God said to him, no, I'm not going to take the thorn away, but I'm going to give you sufficient grace to go through this experience in your life, bear this burden. And many people believe that he had physical ailments. He had, you know, he was stoned at Lystra. He was dragged out of the city and stoned and left for dead. And they believe that his eyesight from that day on, he had partial blindness, if not almost complete blindness. And then Paul had... Paul was, uh, you know, he was transported into the heavenly realm. The Bible says he was. He was caught up into paradise is what the Bible said. And he said he saw things and he heard things that he couldn't even talk about and waited 14 years to even speak of what he saw. Now, I know there's a lot of people who say they go to heaven and come back and hell and come back and all that, and I'm, I'm not getting into all that stuff. We're not here studying that today, but... Uh, I know that the Bible teaches that Paul had an out-of-the-body experience. He said, well, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. He said, I can't tell, only God knows. But he did say he heard unlawful things that he could not discuss with people. Well, I want to tell you something. If you ever catch a glimpse of the glory of God, it'll change your life. There's no doubt about that. Well, that's all I've got to say. I'm about run down. You all wore me out this morning. Father, we just thank you for this time. We love you and we magnify your greatness. I pray, Father, that you'll take this effort that we put forth and use it for your glory. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen and amen.